I speak to you today in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel of Matthew ends with Jesus saying, Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. These words are comforting. They are a source of strength, and many have remembered these exact words in difficult periods in their lives, even at the point of death. These words are powerful, as well as true of our experience of God with us. But as I sat with these words in preparation for today's sermon, I wasn't finding much comfort in them. Instead, I was finding myself wrestling with them, shaken by them. A few questions kept coming to mind, they kept ringing in my head, questions like, Am I to take these words as an endorsement of all that I am doing, and all that I stand for? Is Jesus with me? With us? Is Jesus with you? If Jesus is with us, who is us? So I sat with these questions and looked at the world around me. Protests in city streets throughout this nation in response to the killing of George Floyd at the hands of police, preceded by the deaths of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, and the horrifyingly long list of those in this country's history who have lost their lives simply because of the color of their skin. There's also anger over the actions of a president clearing away peaceful protesters with tear gas and rubber bullets to pose in front of a church. I thought to myself, Many of those that have committed such acts, many of those who have committed such acts of violence have read this passage, have understood this passage as an endorsement of their actions. If God is with us, if Jesus is with us, the thinking goes, who can be against us? But it's not as simple as drawing lines in the sand. Today is Trinity Sunday, so I feel an obligation to say something about that, to speak to that. Something that I hope won't be a tangent, but the foundation of everything that I'm going to say and pray here with you today. What is so meaningful about the Trinity is not what the great church fathers and theologians after them have said, or the councils of the church have agreed that the Trinity is. Now, what is so meaningful is what prompted those people to sit down and figure it out in the first place. Now, Paul, at the end of his letter, his second letter to the Corinthians uh, today, expresses a Trinitarian understanding of God. He names Jesus, he names God, and he names the Holy Spirit all in one breath. Now, Paul is, Paul is not thinking, how can this be? Three persons, one God. Now, I doubt very much that Paul was concerned with that. Paul is speaking of his and others' experience of God in their day-to-day -day lives, as a God who is understood in relationships, not apart from them. For those living in the world at the time of Jesus and Paul, they were not coming to Scripture, they were not reading Scripture in order to understand God, they were going to Scripture to make sense of their experience of God. This God that they encountered in the world around them, they encountered this God through Jesus, the Son of God, and then also through God's Holy Spirit. They encountered this God through one another, in community together, in experiences and relationships with people outside that community. Again, just think of the times that Jesus in the Gospels is seen beyond the societal boundaries eating and laughing with sinners. Scripture does not tell us, in fact, about a time that God was all around. Scripture tells us about a God that is all around, yesterday, today, and in the future. It is still the case that we encounter God out in the world. This is the expression of an incarnate faith. God can be touched, God can be seen, God can reach out and touch us. This is our faith. 
Now, the doctrine of the Trinity tells us that God is always doing something new in the world. The same God who created, who in the beginning created out of that formless void, and then through Jesus, God's new creation. God is always ahead of us, always busy creating. In fact, Paul says, that when someone is baptized in the name of Jesus, there too is a new creation. When they are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, there too is a new creation. Now, the hard part about this, though, and this is the part that we are less comfortable with, that I am less comfortable with, especially as I reflected on this sermon. If God is a God we encounter out there, then God is a God that we encounter over there. God is not endorsing my cause or your cause. God is just with us, showing us, imploring us to listen to God and to one another, imploring us to hear that love is possible, that love will always be possible, that that new thing God is creating in the world is love. So when I or we or you assume that God is with us alone and our moral landscape is superior to another's, and the frame in which we see the world is superior to another's, we have to ask ourselves, is there room for love here? Love becomes harder to realize when we are angry or filled with rage. That is not the God we encounter in Scripture. The God we encounter there is a God who tells the religious order of the day they have it all wrong, who tells us that those with great wealth and power are concerned with the wrong things. Remember, remember the orphan, the widow, and the poor. The God we encounter there is a God who tells us to love to love our enemies, who tells us that justice is God's alone, who tells us that God is most often encountered on the other side of the lines that we have drawn. Again, Jesus eating and drinking and laughing with sinners, with Samaritans, with tax collectors, with all of those that society is quick to dismiss. Jesus is found there. It sounds so simple to love our brothers and sisters, to love those that are different than us. We want to love our brothers and sisters. We want to love those that are different than us. In fact, I think that I do love my brothers and sisters. I think I do love those that are different than me. We think that we love people that are different than us, but if that is the case, where are they? Where are those people that are different than us? Where are they around our dinner tables? Where are they in our neighborhoods? Where are they where we gather and congregate together? And if we know who they are, how close do we get to them? Martin Luther King Jr. said that love is overthrowing everything big and small that is not love. This is not some warm puppy dog kind of love. This isn't Hallmark's version of love. This is the love that marriages are made of, that love that demands work, that love that demands our vulnerability. It's that love that takes all we have to give so we can say with our words, with our actions, this is what makes me better. You are what make me better. It's a love that does not walk away from disagreements, but a love that instead wants to understand, wants to provide strength to another and not merely find strength for themselves. It's a love that can tell us we are wrong, a love that will allow us to hear others telling us we are wrong. A love that will hear others telling us 
imploring us, asking us to listen. This is the love that drives out hate. This is the love that overthrows everything that is not love. And it is a love that demands our full attention. Love is possible here. Yet we are at a time in our nation where we are so very polarized. We are at a time where we cannot imagine the other side being right, only that they are wrong. We are at a time where many of us, many of us are seeing what we have been slow to see. That divisions such as race shape our lives in painful, tragic ways. That our ideologies of conservatism, liberalism, and individualism keep us separated and isolated from one another. Some of us cannot hear the pain and suffering of God's children in the voices of those who shout, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Others cannot hear the fear of God's children and those who shout, Make America Great Again. Or the fear in God's children who shout back, Make America Sane Again. Too often we do not imagine that God could be with those we disagree with. And I have wondered at times in recent years, where is God? For these words from Matthew today, I am with you always, remind me that God is here and now and tomorrow. These words remind me that the way forward is a love that heals another's pain, a love that removes another's fear. Guilt, shame, anger, these are not of love. These tell us that this is not how it is supposed to be. God who has encountered all around us in the everyday, who makes a way where there is no way, this is love. God's new creation is what must be and will be. It will not, it will not be easy. But it will always be possible. Maybe not in our lifetimes, probably most assuredly not in our lifetimes. But we keep building the foundations, and we can keep proclaiming the love of God and of God's Son. Sisters and brothers, Jesus is with us, God is with us. God's animating breath is animating creation, making something new. God is always creating. God's Spirit is always moving among us, inviting us, imploring us to hear the need for our ongoing work in this new creation through those who say, I can't breathe. I have hard, intentional work to do within myself. I have work I need to invite God to do within me, but like me. The church is being called to do something new. The church is being asked to do this work too, to name those things that divide us, to talk in love with one another about them, to look at our history and see where we have willingly done harm, to see where we have done harm, period. We are being called to move beyond the boundaries that we have drawn for ourselves. Because these sides we've drawn are not new. They are of our own making and belong in that category of sin and death, not new creation, not eternal life. God cries out from all of us and all of creation because God is among us, waiting to be encountered, waiting to be seen, waiting for us to admit that love is possible here, waiting for us to listen. As for me, it is time I find the courage and strength to listen, to recognize God in the other and experience new wonders of God's creation there. Sisters and brothers, my prayer for us today, for me today, is that God is here. And my prayer also includes a question. Will you join me as I step over these lines we've drawn?
to proclaim love is possible here. Amen.